I think the first question I wanted to ask Fiona was, um, you've been in Parliament since 2014 and you've um, achieved, I think Rob Barton's described as the hardest working person in Parliament and um, you've managed to have an incredible voice in terms of law reform and what, what from your experience as someone who has a min minority voice in Parliament, how have you been able to amplify your own voice and been able to cut through and achieve what you have in terms of law reform? Yeah, it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, look, I, I, I was actually in, in many ways fortunate that I've been a lobbyist for quite a long time. So I'd actually been trying to affect change from the outside. And then all of a sudden I find myself inside with everyone's phone numbers. And like I had ministers' mobile phone numbers and this this was just quite, quite the opportunity. Uh, I think there, there is, there has, we have formed a formula and like, we understand an issue that has been raised with us with the community. We then find the stakeholders, um, quite often the, the vessel that we will use to, uh, to move this through might be a private member's bill. Um, rather than I think some of the other crossbenchers have tried to rely on motions, like they put a motion on the paper and say, a government should do this um, and what we do is say here's a solution to this problem and here are all these wonderful people who agree with it, who agree that we need to make that solution so I think it's yeah it's been that kind of activist and lobbying background um, and and listening to the community uh, the other thing that you know I don't have a tattoo but if I did it would be don't let the end don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good um, and that has also been so important. Like we put up maybe eight private members bills in the last eight years. Uh, most of them have actually got up um, with the exception of a couple, but not in our name. So I think that's the other thing. You know, you, you really got to be happy to see change happen and not, and not hold on to it. So it's not about taking credit for the successes, but you also recorded. Oh, well, you just heard my CV, of course. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. But it's also like playing it. So I, I think the first time, well, I mean, voluntary assisted dying was our first sort of move, but uh, safe access zones around abortion clinics. That was the first time where we put a bill up in Parliament, which was pretty. Um, we were still pinching ourselves going, oh, we've just done a bill. We've just written a piece of legislation. Anyway, we were, and the government saying, oh, yes, Fiona, like, lovely idea, but now's not the time. And we're like, well, actually, now is the time. You've been saying it's not the time for nearly eight years. Um, now is the time. So if it's not now, when? And they go, soon. So next month, soon? And they're like, no, soon. In the end, I said, we'll take it for a vote. They did not want to vote against safe access zones. They love safe access zones. They didn't want to vote against it. So they agreed that the morning of the debate um, that if I would adjourn the bill off, they would, the health minister, Jill Hennessy, would come out onto the steps of parliament and hold a press conference with me and commit to doing it within six months. And we've, we've, we've negotiated that more than once that um, will accept the idea of adjourning it off because we know they don't want to vote against things. You know, they didn't want to, well, there's a number of um, bills that they haven't wanted to vote against, but this gives them the option and this gives us the, you know, we get it in writing, well, not on writing, but we get it on video, which is these days better. <laughs> Just on health, um, spoke about, um, Jill Hennessy, I just want to ask you about COVID-19 and the response because we were very interested and involved at the yeah. Victoria in relation to the drafting of pandemic specific legislation and I was quite confronted I suppose re reading some of the vitriol and venom online directed at yourself and others um, who there's no doubt from our perspective that Victoria rather than having rolling executive orders needed uh, pandemic specific legislation to stop that just pure executive power and 
and what was done um, in our view at least as an organisation was infinitely more human rights compliant and transparent. Um, but how do you, I mean, clearly online there are a lot of people saying how a grab, there were gallows erected outside parliament, um, the amount of venom was, was incredible. How do you deal with that kind of environment when you're trying to um, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I Actually, it wasn't my fault. No. <laughs> Blame where the boat yeah, is. Yeah, I know. I don't know if anyone. Um, it, it was. It was. Hard. COVID was. I mean, we people were dying. You know, it, it was an awful, awful time, and we were being locked down, and it was hideous, and. You know, um, and I agree with you. And then that was exactly what we said to the government. We we cannot accept these rolling states of emergency. These are this is legislation that is not fit for purpose. It is not fit for a pandemic. It is fit for a hurricane, mm. a bushfire, mm. a flood. Mm. It's not fit for a global pandemic. So we have to do something different. And we put that out there right from the very start. You know, and I remember going on Sky News going and having, you know, Andrew Bolt saying, well done you, you know. No. Nope. That soon <laughs> stopped. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know. Um, but, yes, you're absolutely right, right, Mike. We needed something specific. And so I stand by what we did. And I think in some ways, you know, and Andrew, my chief of staff here, you know, for us also, Mark, being there right from the start, you know, it's one thing to write a bill to change safe access zones or do something like that. It's another thing to be talking to the Solicitor General at 8 o'clock at night going, so what do we want this pandemic legislation to look like? You know, it was almost with blue sky kind of thinking at the beginning. And we worked through that process. And the, the work that Liberty Victoria did, the advocacy that you did, and I'd also say the Human Rights Legal Centre, LIV, um, the Human Rights Centre, the Public Centre of Integrity. So I knew we were on the right side of history when you have those hefty bodies um, in, in, on your side. I knew we were on the right side. Um, that didn't stop the death threats. That didn't stop the vile um, calls. That didn't stop the, the absolute shit that... Um, my team had to put up with a lot, and it, it does take its toll. You know, we couldn't answer the phone in our office because they were ringing us every minute. And, you know, I won't use the language that they used, um, but, you know, it, it, was, it was horrible and there was a lot of threats and we had to take a lot of them seriously. Um, we did prosecute someone under the Federal Telecommunications Act, uh, but... It, the, that yeah so the misinformation and the bloody mindedness of some of the media who refused to report it when they knew, and they knew that they were misinformed mm. uh i think that's that's something that we all need to be very alive to and i don't know what the answer is because you know i'm a free speech advocate but what is the answer when people are actually being misinformed by bodies you know, by media, but um, but also by politicians. Especially given what's been built to really between conspiracy theories and the emergence of far, the far right oh. um, and you know, the lack of trust in institutions, media and politicians. That's right. Uh, and uh, I know the, the work that Palmer's done on inquiring to extremism as well is all very important in that space. Yes. But it really is, from an outsider's perspective, it's, when you see gallows erected outside the Parliament, it's sort of literally... So, uh, yeah, they were walking down with three, one by name on it at one stage. And yeah, as you said, they had the big ones for, for the Premier. I, you know, I can't understand why both parties in this election would not be going on a transparency and integrity platform. Mm -hmm. They, you, you just, I think, I, what have they got to lose? I think there is nothing to lose. And the way that pandemic legislation um, finally came, and it was, you know, it is a good piece of legislation. and. You know, we got it to a certain degree and other people most definitely made it better. Um, but that showed what transparency and integrity, what integrity in politics in Parliament can look like. So I don't, 
know why our major players aren't going on that and saying and truth in and truth in political advertising. Mm. You know, that's a probably a bit more hairy, but just um, greater transparency. Well, we've got to do this because we are losing so much trust, and this is, you know, this is dangerous when people don't trust politicians, when people don't trust governments, when people don't trust the media, they don't trust corporations, they don't trust their churches, they don't trust any institutions. And as you say, this who do they trust? QAnon. Um, you know, well, I don't think anyone trusts Catholic Company, but um, no. <laughs> 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 um, Sarah, I might turn to you. Um, you like the work that you've been doing with the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, and um, from a, again from an outsider's perspective, it's just been incredible over the past few years to see. I mean, Val's has always been obviously a leader, but the the, the quality of the law, law, the submission writing and work that's been produced by Val's has been quite inspiring as an NGO um, to see. And one of the I suppose victories, for want of a better word, that Bowers had was the abolition of um, the offence of public drunkenness um, after the Tammy Day, tragic passing of Tammy Day. And um, I want to ask you about that because um, it perhaps it demonstrates one of the dangers of law reform when you think you've had a, a victory because now, as I understand, it's been delayed. It was due to be uh, commenced in November now, but it's been pushed off until next year. I was just wondering if you could uh, tell the audience about, about your experiences with that reform. Yeah, sure. And I definitely can't take credit for um, any of um, the amazing work that's been done um, on um, public intoxication. And I guess I would start by saying that the offences like public intoxication, public order offences, have always been used throughout the history of Australia to criminalise um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and there have been, and the movements to um, decriminalise public order offences and um, public intoxication offences have been led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are directly impacted by those laws. Um, and there's, you know, throughout the history of um, this country, uh, there have been, um, you know, back in the 70s when um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were campaigning against policing in Redfern um, that led to the creation of the first Aboriginal legal service, the first legal aid organisation, and then, um, you know, the Aboriginal families who lost their loved ones in custody campaigning um, for the Royal Commission into Aboriginal death in custody, of which 35% of um, deaths which were investigated by the Royal Commission um, were for people who were incarcerated due to public intoxication laws. Um, so this is a really long-standing issue which um, so many amazing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have led the campaign um, for decriminalisation um, of those laws um, and the work that has been done by Auntie Tanya Day's family is um, such an amazing example of that. Auntie Tanya Day died, for those who don't know, she died in um, 2017 um, after being arrested for um, public intoxication. She was on the train on the way home. She died in a police cell. Um, and um, since the time of her death, her family has done amazing work in advocating for the decriminalisation of public intoxication, for showing um, us why, uh, you know, incarcerating people and locking them in a cell um, is just, um, it, it's, it's harmful. Um, it can cause um, huge amounts of, um, yeah, it can cause huge harms and trauma to people and can lead to deaths like Auntie Tanya Day's. Um, and, um, well, it, you know, after two years of campaigning, the government committed to decriminalising public intoxication in 2019. Um, they said that they were going to roll out a replace um, the Victoria Police response to public intoxication with their public health-based response um, and said that they were going to trial um, new uh, sites where this public health response would be, uh, would be trialled and um, still, you know, we're sitting and... It was meant to be by November 2022. So now that public intoxication was decriminalised um, and now that reform has been delayed because those trial sites, because those trials haven't taken place. Um, and I think that that, you know, it's hugely disappointing um, because there has just been so many years of advocacy um, that has led to this moment. We know of the huge harms of the criminalisation of public intoxication and 
I'm a see-through, you know, still to this day, even last week, I had a client who came to us um, who was charged with public intoxication. The police um, arrested him. They said that they were going to take him home. And then they drove him to his house. And instead of taking him home, they drove him into a police cell. He sustained injuries as a result of his arrest. So this is just continuing to happen again and again. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's causing huge amounts of harm. And, and it's just, you know, frustrating to see that delay time and time again. I think part of that, you know, I think it's a huge step that the government has committed to decriminalising public intoxication. And that has been because of the efforts of um, Val's and, and Auntie Tanya Day's family um, and many generations of Aboriginal people before then. Um, and I think that we face a really hard opposition in Victoria, um, particularly with Victoria Police. Um, Victoria Police is a hugely powerful institution in Victoria. Um, we have, I think we spend the most amount of money um, on policing out of any state or territory. Um, number of employees at Victoria Police have doubled in the last decade. Um, and that's despite, um, you know, basically stagnant um, or decreasing um, levels of crime or what we perceive to be crime. Um, and so, uh, you know, and we have, you know, assistant commissioners of police who were formerly chief of staff of Daniel Andrews, um, our premier. So Victoria Police has a huge amount of power. Um, and, you know, which makes reforms like the decriminalisation of public intoxication so difficult to push through because we have to come across that power. And I think that that is about, um, you know, we need people in parliament who um, are support, you know, support uh, movements and families, but also we need the general public um, to get behind um, families like Auntie Tanya Day's family um, and the work of these organisations and really... Um, assist them in their advocacy efforts and to, you know, shift our conversation around crime and who we criminalise and the reasons we do it. It's also been a tough one for police association, isn't it? I mean, being quite astounded by mm. seeing, I mean, perhaps they've always been a presence, but in the time that I've been practising law, I'd like now to see the police association doing little stops or um, interviews. So in relation to the Richard Pusey case, for example, mm -hmm. making yeah. comments quite, very emotive comments about him being a worthless human being and very Old Testament um, sort of perspective and, you know, hoping that he suffers. Um, and I, I just haven't seen that level of vitriol expressed in public by what's emotionally the police lobby group before. Um, it's, it's basically very difficult, I imagine, to achieve law reform when that's dominating the tabloid media. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... We saw the same thing around um, Guy Gazoulis and, the, you know, what led to the um, the bail laws being changed. It's, uh, the Victoria Police really strategically use media um, and, you know, really are really strategic in the, in the words that they use and the way that they, you know, promote um, their own role as um, police and in criminalisation of people, um, and which makes it really hard you know, to shift the public debate. But it, but I think that in spite of all of that, there is, you know, some, there is like some shifting public debate about, about crime. It's these skyrocketing numbers of people in prison in Victoria and people asking each other, well, is it actually making our community safer? Um, and certainly from our perspective at Bowles, we see so much harm um, in the criminal justice system and it's our clients who bear the brunt of, you know, it might be people like, um, Richard Pusey or um, James Garkazoulis, who are the subject of this vitriol, but it's, it's our clients who are um, ultimately, they're the brunt of criminalisation. And I don't think that's an accident. It's, um, that's, you know, that's the way that the criminal justice system in Australia is set up. Um, and those people become, you know, good advocacy tools for police to get more power. So you have these atypical cases, perhaps Adrian Bailey is another example of really parole reform there. Um, you know, you have this incredible legislative response that sweeps up a whole lot of more vulnerable people and a whole lot of unintended consequences. Um, perhaps we, if, we, if we could focus on bail yeah. now, given this race, Gar So for people that don't know, Gar Gazors was the driver of the election to Burke Street incident and um, led to the Coblin review that then led to a very significant reform 
of Victoria's bail laws, um, it's had a disproportionate and deleterious impact on First Nations peoples and, and women, um, clearly because it's swept up a lot of um, people that have committed minor offences into what's called the double uplift category. So there's the same test for bail as murderers and um, commercial drug traffickers, uh, terrorists. Um, so, Sarah, can you share us uh, share with your experiences in relation to the impact of bail reform? It's, um, yeah, it's been, it's huge and overwhelming, um, the impact of bail reform in Victoria. Um, after um, the Dirk Street incident, the Victorian government committed to changing bail laws. The changes in bail laws, as you say, um, double up with means being that, um, so there's over 100 offences which are now classed as um, a sort of form, mm -hmm. People fall under this exceptional circumstances test so there's an assumption against bail. Um, and what that means is if you commit an offence like, say, shoplifting um, and um, you are released on bail, if you commit another offence while you're on bail, um, for example, shoplifting related offence, um, you will fall under this, um, this class of people who has to meet a really high threshold to get bail, exceptional circumstances. So a huge burden. Um, and, you know, I guess um, there are a few things like bail laws, in my view, have always been, you know, used as this political tool um, to um, criminalise huge swathes of um, the population. Um, we saw after the Lynn Siege Massacre in New South Wales, bail laws changed there after Garkazoulis. Um, you know, throughout history, there's been this flip flopping of bail laws, um, you know, from really harsh bail laws. And then you see skyrocketing numbers of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, being incarcerated as a result of bail laws. In Victoria now, I think um, half of the people who are in custody after Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are in custody are there because um, they um, have failed to meet um, the bail test, so they're on remand. Um, that means they haven't been found guilty of any offence. Um, and So they're presumed innocent. They're presumed innocent. Um, and uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, that number is even higher. And the fastest growing demographic of people in Victoria's prisons. Um, and I guess, you know, bail laws have always, again, like public intoxication, been used to criminalise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, of the 99 deaths that were investigated, 30% of those people. Um, whose deaths were investigated were not were on remand. Um, and for women, Aboriginal women, 91% of the Aboriginal women whose deaths were investigated were on remand, hadn't been found guilty of any offence. Um, and bail tests um, have you know, often been designed in a way that um, captures um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that makes um, you know, marginalised groups more, um, you know, less likely to be able to meet these stringent bail tests. And be held in prison. So we see a situation now where people are in prison in Victoria for minor offences or offences for which they would never receive a term of imprisonment um, and they're in jail because they can't meet bail laws. There's huge backlogs um, in our criminal courts and in, um, you know, the, and so we see huge amounts of people just being held on jail, on bail for months on end, um, even though they might be in custody for, they might, um, you know, not have received a term of imprisonment. Um, so, yeah. So, what would be the, like, I'm sure there's not a, like, an average, but, like, how long are people generally spending a, um, on the net? Oh, great question. I wish I did not know the answer. Yeah. I not have those answer. I have a colleague here from Pals. Yeah. average, but the on Pals man was the case that women was there for 110 days. Yeah. Then was forced to plead guilty because they are for that time. So, yeah. yeah, and this is the problem like the forcing, you, you get pushed to a situation, like people, our clients get pushed into a situation where they have to, they feel they're advised to plead guilty to offences that even if they haven't committed them, um, because they're likely to spend more time in custody on um, bail than they would if they were sentenced. And, and it, it it also skews the sentencing stats. So mm. all of a sudden we're having people getting jail terms for shoplifting. Mm. So because mm. they're doing a time served, it, with women, I mean, that they're, they're, in, they're remanded 
for enough time to lose their jobs, mm -hmm. lose their housing, yeah. um, sometimes lose their children. Yeah. You know, but I think when we did the report, we, it was around 60, for most it was around 60 days. Yeah. I think it was just, you know, the most disruptive amount of time that, you know, even if those people were experiencing homelessness or mental health or drugs, that was not enough time to provide any assistance mm -hmm. or even, you know, connect them and nav help them navigate through systems. Yeah. It's so clear that the Middle Royal Commission, I mean, just the finding of the recommendation is published in 1991 now, so 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, and that one of the strongest recommendations was that we could not have to make a measure of violence at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bar reform is very things in the other direction. And there's been, I think, 517 First Nations people who have died since the recommendations of the Royal Commission. And it feels like we haven't done anything in 30 years in Australia. Um, Fiona, I wanted to ask you about dealing with, um, Sarah's touched upon it, dealing with you know, powerful lobby groups and police association and and perhaps I wanted to take the conversation to the spent convictions mm. reforms because I, I wonder how when you are faced with such a powerful sort of law and order lobby and law and order, you know, electioneering is such a powerful thing and it's such a, an incentive for the major parties to engage in that kind of rhetoric. How do you manage to pass things such as spent conviction reform? For people who don't know, that's a way for people who have committed relatively minor offences and sometimes fairly long time ago to have that effectively scrubbed from their records so that they don't have to be declared and jobs and those kinds of things, education and um, yeah. So how do you manage to achieve that kind of reform replaced by the powerful sort of lobby group? Um, interestingly enough, like just quickly on the, the spent convictions and I'll go back to it, but interestingly, I didn't have much objection from the police association on that. They, particularly in the initial structure of the bill, which, um, thank you, Rat, for um, mm -hmm. uh, developing the, the first iteration of that legislation. I, I think it actually got better. I think what we passed was a, was a better piece of law. Um, but I, I want to make a differentiation between the police and the police association mm -hmm. and the police minister. Because what I have found is that Quite often, the police are the least of our resistance. So I can speak to the police about a range of, of issues, um, uh, spent convictions, uh, supervised injecting room, um, a range of areas, um, and, and they, they're on the ground and they're sort of saying, well, this makes sense. Police Association has, I think, but un, has had an unhealthy relationship with the police minister's office. And I find that those are, those are the two most powerful oppositions. <laughs> and I just remember when we were debating public drunkenness, and um, I, he, he would not mind me saying this, I met with Wayne Gatt. Wayne Gatt would speak to me about public drunkenness. He's the head of the police association. And I said, fantastic, Wayne. I'm love that you're glad that you're going to speak to me about this because I want to speak to you about the decriminalization of sex work. Because I'm we're just I'm getting to the end of the inquiry and we're we're going to be recommending this. And he said, I don't care what you do with sex work, decriminalize it, do whatever you like, but public drunkenness. Um and he was beside himself on public drunkenness. And you know I I think he has he has had the strongest influence on delaying tactics that have played out with that and on medicinal cannabis and driving again um, the police minister's office just barrier after barrier on that on that issue um, and the words quite often that they spoke with the words that were in press releases mm. from the association but yeah it's 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 working through those and it's working um, you, you've got to work with them but like if you use um, the supervised injecting room, the first people that we went and spoke to, well, obviously we've been speaking to the community and different groups, but once we started that year thinking, okay, this is what we're going to do and we're going to do it soon, we went and met with Graham Ashton. So got a meeting with the police commissioner and started there. And that, I think, was actually a very 
it was the right thing to do. We knew it was the right thing to do. Um, but he came on board with us. He sort of came with us on that journey from early in the piece. Uh, and that was really important. Uh, police association, they're a bit harder. Mm -hmm. um, but we got them over. We got them in the end. Harold Sung, harder again. Got them in the end. Lost them now. <laughs> Maybe we'll, I don't know if we'll ever get them back again. <laughs> um, but you know, we 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 cut, you know, we cut the we hit slicing the sausage um to get to get everyone over the line. Spent convictions, I mean, Rat gave us the start on spent convictions and, and had done, done a lot of the groundwork on that. Then um, the Vows and Wood, the Wodungan Project uh, came through with um, a First Nations perspective and it was just the most beautiful piece of um, uh, work, a great, brilliant report. So we spent convictions. It, in many ways, we had a lot of them along with us. And it was only we lost we lost the police association at the end. Um, we and we lost the opposition at the end. We we had the Liberal Party almost the whole way through until there was legislation around young people. So in the legislation, there was a you know for young people that had committed you know offences and serious offences when they were under fifteen. So when they were ch children, children, that that offence did not go with them as an adult, um, and it would not be disclosed on their you know, and on any public police records. Um, and so we lost the police on that. But it, it, I think kind of dealing dealing with those in, in as you know politics is a numbers game. So and it, you, as long as you can get twenty one in the house, you you can get anything passed and that was you know you don't you, you just work to getting 21 or you know maybe 22 so you've got a spare but um you do work to get 21 you know you're not going to get everyone and with people like the police association sometimes it's talking to them about what we can agree on and then working from there and um we we've done that with them on um well, what we've done it with them on. Um, we, we did it on supervised injection, so I mean, they've, they've certainly changed their mind now, but we did do it with supervised injection and we got them, we got them over the line to support them. I think it might have to do with um, the comments of the research of the OK and doing it with them. And that made me think about the emergence of you know, sort of Trumpism in Australian yeah. political life mm -hmm. and uh, particularly. The work that you've done in relation to um, moments around um, around abortion clinics, that, you know, and, and given what we've seen in the US with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, uh, and um, I suppose it shows us that one shouldn't assume that we're on a path to progressive law reform and things can go backwards and potentially go backwards quickly. So I wanted to ask you know, your thoughts on that. So, uh, the emergence of the religious right in Australia and Victoria. Is that a is that a real threat? Do you see that? I do. I, I do see it as a real threat. Um and you know, we've got so we've got twenty you you'll you'll have the brilliant opportunity to vote for twenty-three parties at this coming election <laughs> on twenty-sixth of November. Um can I just warn you, fifteen of them are pretty shit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I was trying to think of something and not a more diplomatic way to say it, but anyway, I, I couldn't. I didn't. <laughs> um, there's some really conservative people running, and they do want to block any progressive legislation. And and seriously, I, you know, bail laws are so high on my um, to do list. Um, like with Bernie Finn, with um, the far right there, we are not law and order, we will not be able to make sensible movements in this area. But on women's reproductive rights, um, you know, there is so much more to do. 
you know, we think that we, we legalized abortion in 2008, but I tell you, if you live in Mildura, it ain't easy, you know, and let alone if you live somewhere smaller, um, it, it was still difficult, let alone, actually, I don't even know whether it's great, whether you would be, if you um, were pregnant or you were, um, might be sent to the mercy care, so where you will not get any of the reproductive choices that other people go through in school. So, Yes, I am worried about us going backwards. And I certainly am very worried about the lack of forward movement that could happen because we could have a very um, uh, well, angry um, upper house that will block absolutely everything. And it's not just the crossbench. You know, you look at who the Liberal Party can be selected. So we've got, um, they're not the salt shakers, they're the building shakers or something. Um, I can't remember all their names. They used to be the salt shakers, they're a fun more. Uh, but you've also got Labor. You know, Labor's upper house member for Western Metro, where we are now, is Lizzie Blackwell. Now, we ain't going to get any progressive reproductive um, legislation through with Lizzie. Uh, they have also, there's a number of um, Labor right who are coming in there. And if with Bernie, Finn and Adam Sommer on the same side. Um, <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I've got a, I have this plan, like, it's a stupid plan, but I'm just say it now. It, for, we, the upper house is eight regions. So it's eight regions and five of us represent each region. I have been pushing for the, for rather than you sitting with the party and the prospects of him, that you actually sit with the other four members of the region. And that makes you remember and reflect on the fact that you are representing that region and all five of you are representing that region. I actually think that would have quite, a, quite an impact on the oppositional nature of our parliament. Um, and I think that's a good idea until I think that I would be sitting next to Adam Somirek. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, what happened? Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. I wouldn't that's be sitting true. next to Adam. Yeah. Someone from the Labour Party would be sitting next to Adam. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, look, I'm, I'm extremely worried about it. And I'm extremely worried because this government could do some good stuff. And we know that we need reform and bail. Um, we need it's the just, our justice system, as we know, is fairly a system and certainly is just. And, you know, I think we could get some good work done. The other day, I spoke to you know, this at the farm. I said, I just like that. I don't know if you can help me. I don't know if you can do it. But the only simple parts of the form in the form size of the form, the form of the commercial size of the trains, the fish, the farm, the other things. At the moment, people are thinking of buying the bag of petrol and so on, coming up with the train that they can do in the way for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, when we look to things like um, a conversion, which, you know, this most awful notion, um, and it only barely passed out, passed the upper house. You know, we've had the number of organised, the number of political parties in sustainable Australia, you know, voting against it. Um, so, yeah, we are teetering on a knife edge on equality, and, and, we are making we are making some really we have made some really strong moves forward, but there will be pushes to there will be moves to push that back. Uh, there will be moves to do deal. So, you know, I can you know let's not let's not let's try and think of happy thoughts before we go to bed. But before we but but tonight, you know, imagine we've got Bernie Finn, we've got Adam Somurek, we've got um, the Moira Redeering and. You know, Renee, you've got all of these people. The government needs their needs, you know, their vote. And it might be on a law and order order issue. And if I was there, I won't support one. It should be a shit law and order point. They need those numbers. They say, yeah, you can have my vote if you do this. And then you've got, you know, you've got a fairly you might have a very conservative Labour upper house as well, and they might say, it's a deal we're taking. Um, so, yeah, I think we're going to have to be, um, you know, let's
let's try not to be alarmed. Let's just be alerted. Right. Yeah, I think perhaps be alerted out. It's very much right now. There uh, on this on um, Saturday is the uh, I think including the community health services and prisons um, and uh, the role of an uh, international US based for profit company providing health services uh, in uh, in our prison system. Do you have any questions? Sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, did you have any Unique um, and certainly has in terms of the privatization of the carceral industry as a whole. Um, I think we have the most um, private prisons by, unfortunately, compared to any other state, and we are the only state um, in Australia with privatizing all of our prison healthcare. Um, so that is the healthcare provided to people who are in prison. Victoria, it's not overseen by the Department of Health. Um, community health services don't exist within um, the prison system. Um, it's provided by a private corporation, um, Breast Care Australasia, who's a subsidiary of a huge US corporation, Welfare, um, which has a atrocious track record. There's been a number of high profile investigations in the US into them, including by the Department of Justice, have found stories of people, you know, the, the, the lawsuits and investigations speak of stories that there are so many similarities to the stories that we hear um, at Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. So part of um, my role and my team works with um, families, people who've lost loved ones in custody. Um, and in Victoria in the past, what, 12 months, there's been three children who have died in custody, record numbers. Um, there are, you know, it's, I, there's a crisis in agricultural deaths in custody in Victoria, um, a crisis in death in custody, um, and we have corporations that use the what for reason why people die in custody is for medical reasons. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are three times more likely to not receive or require medical care prior to custody, so prison loss is hugely important. Um, and um, instead of, you know, saying, um, you know, Victorians think of, um, you know, we see this huge separation of uh, people in prison, the services that people in prison have provided with compared to the services that the general community have access to. And that further entrenches that divide between criminalized people um, and people who are not criminalized in Victoria. Um, and, you know, we've seen huge, extensions of the number of people in prison, but also huge amounts of opaqueness around the prison system in Victoria. Because of privatisation, um, there are lower levels of transparency and accountability um, for people in prison. Um, investigations into deaths in custody in Victoria. Um, the coroner's court has found that there have just been desktop reviews, um, no statements taken, um, just sort of statements provided by whatever people the um, the um, facility chooses to put forward. Um, it's really, you know, um, and from our clients in prison that, that we work with, we know that health care is such a huge issue um, for them. Um, we, I hear from clients who have um, waited for weeks to see GPs in custody, who have to, um, have, you know, clients who've had strokes in custody and there's been delays in emergency responses, um, who have to wait for months to be specialists, um, just, you know, huge issues and um, a real, and those issues combined with the lack of accountability and transparency means the voice of people who are incarcerated and criminalised are not often, um, you know, highlighted in public debate. We don't often hear from their voices. Um, and so, you know, again, I think, um, there's, it's really important for, um, you know, for all of us to, um, to really platform and highlight the voices of people who are incarcerated because the people who've lost loved ones um, in custody, people who've had contact with the criminal justice system, we have a criminal system in Australia which targets um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which targets marginalised groups and always has. And so we need to bridge that divide um, between, you know, People who are not criminalized, who don't see regular police involvement in their lives, 
and we take over with my club clients that DAOs were so regularly targeted by police, so regularly criminalized, um, and that just, you know, and have experienced that throughout their whole lives. And so it's really important for, um, I think, you know, law and order politics is, um, you know, only gets away, the politicians only get away with um, engaging in law and order politics because, um, you know, because of the silencing of voice of people who are um, trapped in the criminal um, legal system. Um, and so it's so important, I think, I guess from the outside as well as politicians. Um, and I, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, not okay with um, politics and numbers and, and all of that, but I think it's really, you know, politicians listen to voice of the community. Um, and it is so important for us to change that dialogue and to change the conversation around um, what the criminal legal system is and um, highlight and really give platforms to the voices of people who are in the system. So, I'm going to practice on the bail reform. It's not until someone comes in through the door, you have a conference with them, and you're speaking to someone's mother and you're saying, there's no option really in this case, but a significant period of jail because again, the sentence is never say, well, how, I mean, that can't be right. There must be an exception in there. And people aren't, um, it's all that impacts upon their lives directly or a family member or friend. Um, people often don't realize that the erosion of rights that they've occurred in the past years in Korea um, is like a bail and expensive. So, how do you? Um, how do you reach um, the median voter who is going to get them thinking about how to talk to you about on yeah, Is that the right approach? Is, it, is that the right strategy? Is there a quick strategy? I don't know if I have a long answer. <laughs> 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 I don't know if I have a long answer. I don't know if I have a long answer. I don't know if I have a long answer. I don't know if I have a long answer. I don't know if I have a long um, you know, I think there are sort of, there are, we have like these sub amazing examples of work that's been done. Um, like I think the work that's been done by Auntie Tanya Day's family to bring awareness to public intoxication. I think of like other families who've lost loved ones in custody, like Latoya Rule, um, brother Wayne Keller Morrison died in custody in South Australia, and Latoya and their family led um, this massive um, campaign and organized for years and years um, to see the banning of Spitwood. So Wayne Fellow Morrison died after Spitwood um, was used against him and he was held in a prison van. Um, and that advocacy and sustained organizing efforts have led to um, bans on Spitwoods in um, South Australia and other states and territories making commitments. Um, and you know things like the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Death and Custody to become in a vacuum. It came because of you know really organised efforts by impacted <laughs> communities um, after the deaths of um, you know kids like John Pat who died um, decades ago, sixteen years old, um, died in Western Australia from head injuries. Um, his death sparked a massive um, you know, social movement around death and custody, and I think. So we're seeing the family of Patrick's Turvey doing um, a similar thing, leading a huge campaign in the length of so much grief and hardship. Um, and you know, just seeing the amazing advocacy which has been done by Patrick's family has sparked conversations um, throughout this country on racism, on um, the impact of racism on kids, on community safety, and you know, what really is keeping us safe as a community. So um, I think that you know, I look to those campaigns um, and see that that work that's being done and I think that that is pretty inspiring and, you know, gives us direction um, as, you know, lawyers, um, especially, you know, our role is to um, advocate and promote the work of our clients. Um, and so I think that, yeah, that gives sort of inspiration to knocking down some of those law and justice and law and order um, talk. I think the Work that Dow's has been doing on the Veronica Nelson case as well. So Veronica Nelson died at um, Dave Lewis Frost. Again, 
on demand, a chocolate charge, um, and the cause of death was heroin withdrawal. That does not, no diet for heroin, heroin withdrawal, it will not be jail. Um, but what that has highlighted, and I think the coroner has taken a really broad um, approach to that this investigation. I'm, I'm hopeful that that will come down with some good recommendations. And the coroner's court does act as a good advocate for reform. And, you know, while it might take the government's years to respond to it, it, it does it does have an impact. And I think in that case also, um, the fact that the Human Rights Commission has become involved in, in that case also, I, think, I hope, will, will have that impact. And it, it might mean that, you know, I'd love to see us starting to review how we use the human rights, uh, our charter, mm -hmm. and, and whether there's a way to strengthen our charter. And I suspect like, that's kind of a way to, you know, for, for people who don't really care about Veronica Nelson's of, of this world, um, but do care about their own rights, uh, the, the notion of strengthening the charter mm -hmm. and providing it with at least some baby teeth mm -hmm. uh, could be quite popular with the general population. And we'll have that impact of protecting our most vulnerable um, being. It is extraordinary. So in Victoria, I know we had the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act, and we've had that now since 2006, and uh, a long time. Um, and there was a significant review in 2015, I think, but it's been shelved, really. They haven't, with some real practical ways of improving access to the Charter, the operation effect of the Charter, and it just appears to have just been ignored by this government. Are you able to turn your light on why that is? Or? Um, <coughs> look, I think everybody knows that it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And I, I suspect, you know, we it started, I think Mark, Mark Caller might have been AG, a part of that. Um, and I, you know, we, we've gone through a few Attorney Generals, um, Attorneys General in that time. So I think that might have a lot, a bit to do with it. I think the prioritising, and governments don't want to, you know, to strengthen, um, protect, you know, charters like that that would actually, you know, hit them on the back of the head. Uh, so that's that's difficult. But I actually, you know, I I feel like the time, you know, we're getting to that point where we are going to need to do that. And if the government is, if the government really has listened to the growing disdain of which they're seen in our community. So we will start to see some acknowledgement of that and transparency of that. Then the charter could be a really great vehicle for, to do that. Mm -hmm. And you know, then you look at things like, you know, under, under when we write a piece of legislation or when we go to debate a bill, um, we have a scrutiny of acts and regulations committee that looks at that bill and just and and questions how it meets the requirements of the charter and whether it breaches the requirements of the charter in any way. Um, a lot of times we find that legislation breaches the charter, uh, but the, the government of the day uh, and we write to the, government, the minister and say, you know, there, there, there is inconsistencies here. The minister is not required to respond. Um, they generally do after the legislation is passed. Um, <laughs> very helpful. Yeah. Um, and, but they'll say, well, we think that there was good reasons for it and good grounds and this was, you know, security and, you know, mm -hmm. keeping people safe and et cetera. I, I think we could strengthen that, that process and we could improve that process and, you know, maybe not have the Scrutiny of Acts and Regulations Committee that is scrutinising government legislation being run by the government because mm -hmm. apparently, you know, not surprisingly, they don't find a lot wrong um, with their work. But I, I just think that's an area that could be a way of helping. And the Charter is such a good, I mean, I guess the Charter and coronial inquests for us, I'm going to say something very unloyally, they're great, um, you know, because I think lawyers like to think that, like, their actions and the cases <laughs> actually change the world. Um, and I guess I tend to think that, um, you know, 
things like the charter, which allow our clients to um, really give voice to um, you know the harms that they've suffered. So to be able to say my dignity was breached in custody um, because I was strip searched, to be able to say that um, your human rights have been breached, it's a language that we all speak, and it gives our clients the um, capacity and the forum to actually be able to tell those stories. Um, and a courtroom is a place where they, is, you know, they have at least um, to you know, some extent principles of open justice. And so it's a place that the public can access, it allows our clients to tell stories. Mm. Um, and so the charter can be a great vehicle for that you know, public consciousness raising, public awareness raising. Um, you know, some of the frustrating things as a lawyer um, working with things like the charter is you see, you know, you can bring a case under the charter and um, you can be successful in that case and then the government can change the law the next day, right? And so what, um, you know, and, and that is just, you know, part of the futility of being a lawyer, but also, you know, the real power in legal cases is um, that, that public forum. And the coronial inquest is so, um, you know, I guess because they're the one part of our legal system which is geared towards truth telling in some respects. And even though I think that, you know, there are huge issues of delays um, in coronial inquests, the fact that our, you know, clients have a voice um, and that people's stories are able to be told through inquests just gives the public that broader awareness um, of issues which are experienced day to day. Um, Do you think this Nice question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think that as as we look forward to treaty and as we look forward to our um, the sessions assemblies and and how that's going to look, do you think that's another? Is that something that we can also look with some optimism that that process and that self determination will also impact our judicial system and certainly our prison system? Yeah, I mean, I guess I can't um, speak for Europe, but I, but it, you know, I certainly hope that mm. people will be telling, and you know, from already from the testimonies that have been that we've heard through the Euro Commission, um, which is so you know focused on criminalisation and on the ongoing effects of colonisation, um, I would hope that having you know self determined process mm. and by you know hopefully the government engages in treaty negotiations in the way that's been called for um, by the First Peoples Assembly um, and by um, the Aboriginal community. But, you know, certainly having that, um, you know, shifting that power to these organisations and allowing these stories to be made public, I would hope that that would um, create some change, um, you know, because there's just been, in Victoria, so much backsliding um, and really horrific law and order policies that, um, you know, it seems like often the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, are fighting against this really impactful system. Thank you both so much. I, know, I do know the time. Uh, I just want to know um, <coughs> if there's any questions from the floor. Okay. On the Sarah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just in relation to Bail Act now, there's still section 3A which relates to discrimination in relation to Aboriginal person. Yeah. Why doesn't that section work to reduce the rate of Indigenous people? It's a great question. Um, one that was thoroughly investigated in the Veronica Nelson inquest or, or looked at in the Veronica, I wouldn't say thoroughly, but it was looked at in the Veronica Nelson inquest, which is still before the court. Um, I think that there's a real lack of awareness amongst the judiciary and amongst um, you know the legal profession about um, what 3A is actually meant to mean, um, and a lack of you know yes there are so many <coughs> lack of training around the impacts of you know what what 3A is meant to be applied for um, you know at vowels. We are strongly of the view that 3A needs to be strengthened um, and that um, judges need to take into account the impacts of criminalisation, um, of disproportionate criminalisation on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and that needs to be considered under 3A. Um, 
um, and that, you know, Aboriginal legal services, I guess, uh, Aboriginal legal services are not funded to be at um, a lot of courts in Victoria. Um, a lot of people are provided with the option of having culturally safe legal representation. So there's, you know, issues of education of the legal profession, education of the judiciary, um, but then, you know, and then the operation of the Bail Act as a whole, you know, just being so, um, so uh, harsh and so um, pitted towards the criminalisation of our clients, more like Quota 3A, um, but then it's not even being applied properly. Yeah. And all the jurisprudence sort of centres around um, more serious criminality, right? Like that's one of the things that came through without prejudging the inquest, so that you know, we have all these jurisprudence about exceptional circumstances that imply three streams to alleged murderers and terrorists, and then suddenly you now you've got people in that category for very low level offending, and people just aren't trained in relation to how things like TRIA can operate to get over that threshold and into exceptional circumstances. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, I guess, what, what, for your question, Fiona, like the part of uh, you know, the role of Europe in, um, in of, like, you know, treaty negotiations in Victoria is to, like, educate the public mm -hmm. about um, what is the relationship between the criminal justice system in Australia as it's been set up and the ways it's been used to target First Nations people. And hopefully that seeps through to our um, judiciary and lawyers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, on a kind of slightly positive note on that, when we were doing the spent convictions and so we we had started and Andrew and I put, put up the private members bill and it was largely reflective of the work of RAT. Um, and then we did the inquiry and we had Wardungan and we had Uncle J Jack Charles and like and and the recommendations that came out of that that inquiry took us quite quite a bit further into what we thought was required and the setting the bars. A, a, a lot more generous, generously. We then heard from the government as they were getting it, as it was being drafted and it was back in the department, that they were going to do it, but they were going to take it back to pretty much the original um, stock standard conservative spent convictions. And we advocated that First Nations people and Wardungan had insisted on these principles and, and positions and if they really believed in self-determination, if they really believed in, they were talking treaty and at the time, then they had to listen to that and they had to respond to that. And to their credit, they did. They actually, we, we managed to, to turn it around at a relatively late stage and they, they did actually give, give us something that was a pretty good piece of legislation. I think something like that might also have done with the age of the number of criminal responsibility, given the disproportionate impact of that on First Nations people? Uh, I think we are so close on it. Um, uh, unfortunately, now that Northern Territory has gone with 12 um, and set a precedent, I'm concerned that it's going to be very hard for any jurisdiction to take it above 12. But I think there's, there's possibly other ways that we can keep people out of prison and, and that's really just looking at incarceration as the very, very last resort and really um, work, working on that area. But I'm, I'm not confident that we're going to see 14 in Victoria. Any Sadly. other? Yeah. Any other questions from uh, Laura at all? There's one in the chat. Oh, yeah which is, um, what are your views on the new Anti-Corruption Commission in Restoring Integrity and as a vehicle for law reform? Okay, um, it's, it's a really good question because I don't think we've ever thought of, uh, of IVAC or of our Anti-Corruption Commissions as being a vehicle for law reform. Um, it, it, oddly, they, they should be, you know, and, um, we do, we say we're going to accept the recommendations of IVAC when they do investigations. I don't know whether it actually comes forward. Um, I, I would hope that um, what, where we fall down is that the government then says we accept all the recommendations of IVAC or an ICAC or whatever it is, but then they <coughs> never implement them. So how do we 
how do we make that process, um, how do we ensure that what they say is what they do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we see it, I, you know, if, if there's a body of work that I'd love to do is look at all of the recommendations from all of the parliamentary reports where governments have agreed to those recommendations and then do a count on how many they've implemented. Um, and it's that kind of scrutiny that I, I think will assist, but it's that follow through. You know, government's supposed to respond to parliamentary reports within six months. It's written in the law that they must. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, there's nothing written in the law about what happens. <laughs> There's no consequences, so they just don't. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a it's strengthening the the follow through and um, I, and I don't know how we do that, and I don't know what government would agree to be obliged to ex to implement all recommendations from um, anti-corruption organisations or 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 other independent scrutiny bodies. Well, I do know it's fine. Um, thank you both so much, especially uh, in the middle of literally an election campaign, and we wish you all the best for that. And um, and thank you for the work that you've done um, over the past two terms. It's really been a champion of evidence-based reform and uh, inspiring to see what you've been able to achieve. So thank you for taking the time to speak to us tonight. And thank you also, Sarah, for joining us, and thanks for all the work that Val's is doing.